Welcome everybody to this week's Vermont Vegetable and Berry Grower webinar featuring Terry Bradshaw of UVM, Sue Haney of Sweet Seasons Farm, and Laura Nora Lake of uh, Sweetland Farm in Norwich. And we're talking about adding fruit to a diversified vegetable farm. Take it away, Terry. Excellent. Thanks, Vern. Um, so I'm going to give a quick outline of some of the things we're going to talk about. And this is one of the favorite pictures I ever took uh, in an orchard a few years ago at Liberty Orchard in Brookfield. And sometimes I quiz the audience, but I won't, won't make people do that right now. But in this shot, if you pretend that that cow is a dairy cow, um, you've got milk, maple, and apples. So you've got what, at least for a long time, uh, were and to some degree still are uh, the three primary uh, wholesale commodity crops in the state. So I just I just always liked a little bit of that. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, I've worked in apples for the last 25 or so years. Um, so both of these are, are near and dear to my heart. Um, but uh, increasingly in the last few years, I've been working in vegetable production uh, or at least teaching vegetable production or co-teaching. Uh, and so we see a lot of people who are interested in kind of marrying these disciplines. And so that's sort of where I, I am coming from in terms of uh, presenting this information. So these are sort of an outline of some of the considerations I'll be going through all of these in the next half hour or so before we uh, start sharing with our, with our group. I love these pictures that were uh, put in a book by, put out by a friend of mine, uh, Rowan Jacobson, lives in Callis, like myself, um, and it highlights uh, an apple tree through various parts of the season. And I just love how you get the apple, the, you know, the cows in that back one again. Um, I use this in a lot of different uh, uh, venues. And what I like to mostly point out is that this is a perennial crop. This tree is not going to move anywhere. Uh, and so when we think about uh, managing, but even stepping back and planning an orchard, that's a key concept is this, no this notion of perennial management. And that's something that's very different than what you might have with, um, you know, vegetable crops or other annual systems. And that means that we need to think about the landscape of that orchard in a little bit different lens. And I'm not saying that we don't think about the ecology of the surrounding systems when we think about uh, an annual cropping system, but that tree cannot be rotated. You can't rotate your crops. Um, there's, uh, you know, so, so one of the key tools in uh, pest management, in crop management, in soil management is taken out of the toolbox or at least in the toolbox in a very different drawer. Uh, and so the, we really need to think year to year, this slide highlights the pest management factors, but even more so, uh, or I would say just as important, the nutrition um, of, the, of the tree in terms of, of the nutrient requirements of the tree and, and of the soil, um, the crop management from year to year is really a long-term process. So when you are determining how many fruit you leave on your tree this year, you are really determining how many fruit you're going to have next year just as much as this year. And so it's a different mindset. Um, and that's a kind of a really important thing that I like to highlight uh, to people who are thinking about getting into this uh, you know, potential business. This uh, graphic from Bruce Barrett is pretty old now, uh, but it, it kind of highlights the concept of an overall orchard management system as being like a puzzle and all the pieces need to fit together or you're gonna have gaps in the system. And so I'm gonna talk about a number of these or most of these, or I guess all of these factors, but it's all something, they're, they're all interdependent upon one another. Um, there's a lot of overlap, uh, but it's really something you've gotta think about before you ever dig that first hole and plant that first tree. Because remember, you don't have a chance to rotate out of a bad system. You, your site is your site. Um, the variety and the rootstock, the rootstock, you, you really don't change. The variety you can, but it gets really expensive to plant something wrong and then have to go back and fix it. And all of these are done within systems helps. that um, just, uh, are changing quite a bit in, uh, uh, in modern times. And I'll walk through those a little bit. 
meetings, if you don't mind, just having me occupied. Did you have something you wanted to? We finally got the rest of that quote in. With I'm hearing sound. something in my headset. Is anybody else hearing that in their headset? Well, I can tell you yeah. was roughly what's going on, but what I'm seeing. In the okay, community. I'll just turn. I'll just. Uh, oh, you're looking for the milk. Is that the one you're yeah. doing? Okay. Sure. Well, I've got. And um, okay, there was at least one more genus to the city of my seats. That is not like Deborah need her need to mute mm -hmm. her microphone. Yeah, can I, I mute from here? Oh, there we go. Good, perfect. Um, sorry about that. Um, so let me go back to so one of the key, I would say, the most important aspect to considering your long-term orchard uh, establishment and planning uh, is the number one, I would even say one, two, and three, uh, is the soil water drainage. Um, this is an absolute must, and this is where things get pretty different. If, if you're in the vegetable world, and I'm making the assumption that a lot of the people uh, in this, uh, on this webinar are coming here from an angle of, of vegetable cropping, um, it's not to say that that soil water drain, drainage isn't important for um, uh, you know vegetable production, but it's absolutely critical for tree fruit. This is a picture in the UVM orchards uh, back in 2000. It was either nine or 11. Uh, I think it was 11 ducks swimming in the orchard. Um, this is not a common occurrence. If it was, then this would not be where you would have trees. Uh, and this does happen at times. This was. Uh, one of those springs where it started raining in April and didn't stop until about June 15th. Uh, and this site is at the bottom of the bowl of the farm, even though from a macro level, if you step back and, and you look at the farm, you think it's fairly flat and, and you know, there's no real bowl. There, there is. Um, and so this is an absolute must. And a lot of orchards uh, go go through some kind of you know, site remediation uh, prior to planting to address this. That may be berming, that may be tile drainage, uh, that may be French drains, but this is a condition you really, really have to avoid. Um, and so it's number, like I say, number one, two, and three in terms of planning your site. The other thing that's important about planning your site um, is keeping your orchard out of the cold zone. And so not only do we worry about water drainage, in the soil away from the site, but also frost drainage. And sometimes these go hand in hand, but not always. Um, and so this, uh, I think I've got a, a slide here. Yeah, um, this zone right here, kind of on the shoulder of the hill above a valley is often one of the most um, uh, friendly to managing a, an orchard in terms of frost prevention. I often say that, uh, you, you typically don't see orchards down the bottom of the valley. Uh, and that's because they that's where the frost sits. Uh, and that's, that's a real important consideration, especially when we think about how many vegetable plantings are located down near the rivers. Uh, and you work around uh, the frost different ways. You plant later or you use row covers. Um, we can't plant later. Um, we, for all intents and purposes, can't use row covers. Uh, so we need to plant on a, on a site that is not prone to receiving late frosts or early frosts, but late frosts uh, on the blooms are, are by far um, the most damaging. Once fruit are ripe in the fall, uh, they can typically handle a frost, uh, you know, as long as there's not a hard freeze. And even, a, you know, 28 degrees, they're fine if they thaw out prior to harvest. So that's not the concern. It's really in the spring. The other uh, uh, way that, or the other site uh, aspect that affects drainage for the better uh, is planting near large bodies of water. And I mean large. So, um, you know, planting next to your pond, you know, your farm pond isn't gonna affect this. Um, planting next to, on the shoulder of the, on the bank of the Connecticut River won't affect this very much, uh, a little bit, but but not much. Really, in those valleys, those river valleys, you need to get up and and out of that cold zone. But Lake Champlain, obviously, um, a lot of the the Great Lakes, you know, the major fruit production areas in in the eastern U.S. are up against, you know, at least within a few miles of 
the Great Lakes. And that's because that uh, large mass of water uh, holds on to heat and releases that heat slowly and buffers frost effects. Um, there's very few sites in Vermont, aside from along Lake Champlain, where the body of water is big enough to provide that buffering. Uh, but we do have some orchards that go right up to the lake, uh, and that, that's considered a, uh, uh, a real benefit for those sites. So another thing to think about, and this is kind of a segue into one of my next pieces, is your market. Um, and whether or not you need uh, people to access your orchard. Um, in the vegetable world, there's there's not a lot, there's some, but but you know, pick your own is not a, a, a major uh, piece of, of vegetable management, whereas it is a substantial piece of orchard uh, uh, marketing. And it becomes a little bit different thing to think about if you're planning your orchard for people to get in and out as opposed to for your workers and your wagons of you know laden with fruit and produce to get in and out um and so that's a pretty important concept you know how far out are you on you know the back road that that is hard to uh, direct people to um do you need a good retail location i think the retail location is just as important for you know a vegetable stand as it is for a fruit stand uh, but i know that we've had some issues where you know, most of our large wholesale orchards are located either in the uh, lower Connecticut Valley or especially the Champlain Valley, and often in pretty rural parts of the of the Champlain Valley. Uh, and having shifting those as the market has changed and shifting those over to a retail operation gets pretty tough when you live in a farm in in a, in a town of 1,200 people. Um, and there's you know. 300, 400, 800 acres of orchard in that town. Um, and so that's, it's something to think about. So um, planning your planting and where on your farm you're going to have uh, for your um, site for your orchard is, is pretty important. Some other things I like to highlight, so I'm gonna segue now into marketing and I'll, I'll leave these slides up for a few, for a few reasons. Um, one is, um, the the vagaries of the pick your own population that's his upper right uh picture was a a farm that i used to work at uh years ago and they have these signs and others all over the farm um that require you to really educate your customers so that not only are they harvesting the fruit that you want them to harvest but they're not damaging the fruit that they don't want to harvest um and that's a that's a real consideration where in, in many pick your own orchards, you might get a loss of 20 plus percent of fruit that hit the ground uh, from you know, sloppy pickers. We call those Monday morning drops. And there's things you can do with those drops, but it's not uh, as simple as it used to be. Um, and so those, that, that's a real potential for loss. Um, sometimes you get sort of a mission creep. You know, We see uh, an old student of mine might work in the donut machine uh, down on the bottom left. Uh, a lot of our orchards, mentioned that that they're glorified bakeries uh, and they don't complain because those donut machines, I've heard it re uh, referenced as a reverse ATM machine, um, but it does kind of get you out of, uh, you know, the farming side and more into other aspects. And then of course, there's the concept, once you start bringing people on the farm is, where does it stop? When are you, when are you gonna become the, the corn maze uh, uh, operation? Um, all these can generate money, but it's something you need to really think about whether or not you're interested in, in kind of playing that, that game. Okay, so thinking about marketing. Um, you know, I, we can talk a bit about wholesale. I think for the scope of this audience, uh, if you're not already in this game, you're not gonna get in this game. It's, it's, it's a, a difficult market to get into. It's a shrinking market. Uh, in Vermont anyway. And when I say wholesale, I'm talking about the uh, the traditional Vermont wholesale market of growing fruit, uh, harvesting, packing house, storage, put it on a truck and sell it at a grocery store anywhere from Maine to Texas and maybe Europe. Um, that's a that's a you know slim margin uh, business that that's really hard to get into. Now, another form of wholesale, of course, is, pick the fruit, maybe put it in your cool bot and sell that to the local co-op. That's a different, that's a different wholesale. Uh, and I do think there may be some room for that, although most of the orchards that have played in the larger wholesale uh, marketplace 
are already starting to operate, or I would say are operating in that place. So you really got to have something that differentiates yourself from them um, because there's some real long-standing uh, contracts and relationships in that world. So most uh, producers uh, you know, that, are, that are in this audience would be looking at a retail operation. And most of your large wholesale growers, and many of them have been moving in, into the retail uh, operation as well. So, you know, the, cost, the, the, the prices are yours, you know, the, the revenue is yours, you don't share with the packing house, you're not operating on that same uh, razor thin margin, um, but you get to deal with all the issues of people coming in and out of your orchards um, and the potential for liability and, and other things like that. So it's just something to really think about, but you really need to differentiate yourself. If you are planning to, you know, grow Macintosh and sell them off the back of a truck. Um, what makes you so special compared to, you know, the many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of bushels of fruit that are already doing that. So you need to think about a little bit different angle. Which brings up, now I'm segueing into, into cultivars, um, you know, what you're looking for in terms of cultivars. There's, you know, a lot of people, there's the, the trope thrown about that there's eight to 10,000 different apple cultivars uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, realistically, there's maybe a couple hundred that are available uh, through nurseries. Realistically, there's maybe up to 50 that are worth growing uh, for fresh fruit anyway, give or take 50 on either side, um, depending on your marketing. Um, and so there's a, you know, you can go into a lot of thought presses about this. Um, and, and you really should. So you really need to get out there and try uh, people's, you know, try these these fruit at other places, see how they are to determine whether or not, A, you want to grow them and B, people are buying them uh, before you stick a tree in the ground because, let's go back to the first slide, uh, that tree is permanent. So, you know, it's a perennial crop, you're not going to change that variety for all intents and purposes. And, you know, really at the end of the day, what's your market? What's the saleability of the particular variety you're going to grow? Um, I'll make a few recommendations coming up here, but you know, I think every orchard needs to kind of suss itself out. This is from a, a survey that's getting kind of old, but um, I'm going to say, unfortunately, um, this hasn't changed a lot. So we did a survey of, of, of the orchard, you know, the apple industry about 10 years ago to see what varieties or cultivars people were, were growing. And anything in this pie chart is either Macintosh or a daughter of Macintosh. Uh, and then the other slices are a few other things, including a pretty large slice of Red Delicious. If anything has shrunk, I would say it's that one. Um, but there's really a not a lot of non-Mac or Mac type fruit um, that are grown on any large scale in, in Vermont. Um, and so I think there's room to, to play within that. But there's also you know, it's really important to also remember there's a culture around Macintosh and Macintosh uh, uh, daughters and the Macintosh flavor profile that can't be ignored. Uh, so I think it would be tough to not play at all in some part of the arena of that. Um, but don't think that, again, what makes you so special uh, in terms of growing a bunch more Macintosh? Likely, very, very likely, um, there's an orchard that's growing this for much cheaper than you can grow it for and will happily supply your farm stand for it. So, you know, it's one of these things you kind of have to play in that game, but, but I, I caution, uh, um, you know, new growers to overplant on overplanted varieties. So a real uh, interest often is in heirloom varieties. And I kind of zoomed straight into um, what I would say are less uh, commercial varieties, like much less commercial varieties. A lot of these heirloom varieties and, and you know, heirloom varieties, there's, there's a question in terms of, you know, how do you even define them? Um, under certain definitions, Macintosh is an heirloom variety. Red Delicious is, or the Hawkeye version of, of Red Delicious is an heirloom variety. So I'm gonna all, you know, suggest, you know, they're, they're a variety that's been around for a long time, um, is less commercially prominent and um, has some kind of interesting story to tell. Um, but oftentimes they didn't make the commercial cut for a reason. Um, it may be because they're they're too tender or too hard to to move through the processing channels, and that's a, a trope that's often 
kind of thrown around about them. Uh, but it's not entirely true. Macintosh is pretty soft and we've still found ways to, you know, protect that fruit and market it through the channels. A lot of times these varieties tend to be biennial or have disease issues or, uh, you know, other inconsistencies um, that make them, uh, that made them fall out of favor, but that does not mean they should be ignored. There's a few of these that I think are, are interesting, um, but none of these, I'm not necessarily recommending the ones that I'm showing here. I'm just showing a, a handful of, of those that are out there. Um, and again, I really recommend that people try these fruit and see the trees uh, before planting a whole bunch of them. And I could tell you a story from my undergraduate days about ordering 600 of the wrong trees uh, when I didn't have a penny to my name and then finally figuring out a way out of that little situation. Uh, but I thought I was gonna be the heirloom variety king of Orange County, Vermont. Uh, I do think there are um, a number of varieties that provide something different, um, provide a higher quality experience than a lot of people are, are used to, um, but don't necessarily have to fall within that uh, heirloom uh, category. Minnesota has done a fabulous job breeding apples, not just Honeycrisp, um, but a number of the other ones that I show on here. And I, I put Harrelson with a question mark because that was a really popular one until uh, Honeycrisp pushed it aside. And I think it still has space. The thing about the uh, Minnesota uh, apples is they're all bred for cold resistance, uh, cold hardiness. Um, and so they're pretty, I, I, would, I would say they're, um, extremely reliable in terms of tree health uh, in Vermont. Uh, there's a few new ones out of New York. I, I highlight a couple of these, Snapdragon and Ruby Frost, as two examples of what we call club apples. Um, those are um, high quality fruit released under a controlled release program that you have to be kind of a part of the club in order to join. And I won't go too much further into that. Um, but to say that you won't have access to them. I don't have access to them, but there's some new ones that came out of New York just this year were released um, that I'm excited to try. I've tried firecracker as a fruit, not as a tree, um, that are really high quality and are openly available and nurseries are just starting to release them. And I mentioned a few other ones here um, that I think are worth looking at as uh, superior varieties in terms of consumer experience. Another important thing to consider, and I'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes, um, but is disease resistance uh, of, of, your, of the, the variety that you have planted. Apple scab is the most uh, damaging, potentially damaging disease of apples uh, grown in Vermont. And all of these that I show and, and some others are, um, are bred as part of a uh, coordinated breeding program or actually about three different programs have released these varieties. Um, they contain a gene, they're conventionally bred, um, but they're, it's, a, it's a gene from a species of crab apple that's immune to apple scab. Um, and so these are some high quality uh, varieties that uh, can certainly reduce the headache of managing these, uh, this crop and still provide high quality fruit. Uh, we have some orchards that are kind of specialized in growing these. Uh, and you know it's 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 an area where you can really simplify your life, um, but it does narrow you down to maybe I would say eight to ten uh, varieties that are that are commercially available um, that you know you can access and, and plant on your farm. Uh, Vern just sent me a question the other day about about what plum and peach, uh, and he specifically asked about cherry varieties. Um, stone fruit, those are all what we call stone fruit, uh, prunus uh, uh, is the genus, um, can be grown in Vermont, um, but it's definitely riskier from a number of different aspects. Peaches are risky, I think somewhat obviously, but because of the cold temperature issue, you've really got to be in one of the warmer sites in um, you know, the Connecticut Valley, Champlain Valley. There's spots you could, you could do it inland, but I know every time I've stuck a, a, a peach tree in the ground, at my house in Washington County, I might as well just throw 30 bucks in the hole and, and walk away because uh, they, they die. Um, but it could, be, it could be done, but certainly plums and cherries, and when I say cherries, I mean tart cherries. Uh, sweet cherries are, are much more difficult and, and really should be done in the Champlain Valley and also have some, some production risks. Um, so I haven't, I just planted my first peaches 
in a site that I trust them to grow, which is at the Hort Farm in, in South Burlington, uh, in about 30 years. Uh, so, and they haven't made it through the winter yet. So I don't have a lot of good uh, information on varieties of peaches. I have commercially grown peaches and plums in both Massachusetts and Vermont, but the trees were planted ahead of me. So I didn't select the varieties and they were already there. Um, really the person who's done the most work uh, on both of those is Renee Moran at University of Maine. Uh, and she's, you know, the, the sites that she's evaluating are similar to uh, Vermont sites. So I, I post these fact sheets, they'll be posted in the links later as a place to go to uh, get some information on production of stone fruit. Okay, now we're gonna talk about system. So when we think about what we call standard orchards, these are the old style sprawling trees that you might find uh, you know, in, in what I call the old farmhouse orchards. Very low installation costs because you know, it's few trees, you know, maybe a hundred trees per acre, um, no trellis, no, no real infrastructure, but extremely low precocity. And this term precocity that I use uh, references how quickly, meaning the number of years from planting on, uh, do these trees produce a marketable crop? Marketable meaning more than just a couple apples, not the quality apples, but, but just the number of them. Uh, the precocity of, of orchards like this are, you know, 15 years maybe before you're starting to actually get a substantial amount of fruit. And the payback period ends up being really long on these. Nobody is planting this style of orchard anymore. Uh, but there are uh, orchards like this that people might take over and manage uh, because they exist, uh, which is fine. These, these can be very highly productive, um, but they also can be really sapping of your labor, uh, particularly with the pruning and the harvesting, which are your two primary uh, labor areas. And I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. This is more of what I would call the industry standard, if you will, is the, the semi-dwarf orchard that, that people are used to seeing a freestanding tree, maybe a piece of electrical conduit or a small wooden pole next to it just to keep it growing straight. Uh, but by the time these things are, are established, they tend to stand up on their own. Um, they tend to be around a long time. These might be planted, you know, 150 to 300, maybe low 400 trees per acre. So they're relatively inexpensive to plant or they're cheaper to implant. Um, they tend to produce for a long time somewhat precocious, you know, by the seventh year, you might be in full production, but that's a long time to wait while you've, you know, could be doing other things. Um, these are common. These are pretty resilient systems. They've got pretty deep root systems. So they they, they have less issues with, with need for irrigation. Um, these are still being planted. They're, they're sort of not favored by the, the big industries. Uh, you know, the big, the, the large wholesale side of the apple industry, which is working on those razor thin margins. Uh, but I do think this is a system that could work uh, on a um, kind of diversified scale. Dwarf orchards, um, I think, ha are the worst of all worlds. Um, so this is where you take a, a fully dwarfing rootstock and plant it in this same uh, single tree uh, tied to a pole system. Um, high installation costs because you plant more trees per acre just to fill in this space. Um, Precocity is is not as good as it could be, and the production tends to slow down uh, after about 10 years when the canopy in here starts to fill in and start shading. So typically, when people are growing dwarf trees now, they're growing this tall spindle type of system, um, and that is a the, you know the modern system that a lot of your um, uh, commercial wholesale orchards are sort of moving to. Uh, somewhat in Vermont, but especially in the major production regions. This is where you're, uh, when I say, um, you know, high uh, uh, potential coming out, but but really high needs going in. Um, $25,000, $30,000 an acre to plant. Um, the management in the first couple of years is pretty high, but after that, labor costs go way down. Um, and so you're growing trees sort of like you would grow uh, high tunnel tomatoes. Um, everything's tied up to wires. If you take the wires down, the, the whole system falls down. Um, but you're, you're, you're really focusing on growing fruit as opposed to wood. Uh, and the economics on the macro scale favor this production, but not necessarily 
on a diversified scale where you might not have all that upfront money to, to invest in such a system. And I wouldn't be remiss in this, uh, in this audience if I didn't sort of discuss the concept of polyculture orchards. Um, this is something I see and I do understand, particularly when you've got maybe a semi-dwarf system that's gonna take 10 years to produce and you've got all that extra land growing something in between. This is a, a farm I used to work on where they were growing strawberries in between the orchard, in between the rows, even in a tall spindle system. And um, what I've seen uh, in my experience is it's very rare that someone is able to manage both of these crops optimally. Usually one of the crops ends up suffering, if not both, because you're trying to do, like, and here's a classic example, it's hard to even find the trees through the weeds in, in this particular system. Um, so what I recommend until you kind of fine tune things is focus on the orchard, focus on the other crops. Um, but as you try to mix them up, it's real easy to kind of get, uh, to get mixed up yourself and, and to suffer, uh, you know, to, to suffer as a result. Okay, a few thoughts on management of orchards once they are established. A real, real consideration, and I referenced this early on, is the idea of, of annual bearing, uh, or even more so biennial bearing. So this is a, a tree at the, at the UVM Hort Farm taken in one year and taken from the same spot a year later. You can see that tree has no apple. That has not been harvested. There were no fruit in that second year. Uh, and that's a pretty common thing that happens. And we think about this with, with wild apples. This year is a good example. Uh, this was a no apple year, uh, whereas the odd numbered years tend to be the, the, um, the, you know, the, the bumper crop years. As a fruit grower, you need to manage for this. Uh, you can't afford to have no fruit in certain years and still have all the management costs. So what we would do is we, and we, this is a very, very common regular practice uh, thin off fruit, uh, either at bloom or just after bloom, either by hand um, or using a chemical or hormonal thinning sprays that trick the tree uh, into thinking it's got more fruit than it does so that the, the fruit absizes or the tree absizes more fruit and helps to reduce the load on that tree um, growing fruit so that it can send some resources into growing fruit buds for the next year. Remember, perennial crop while these fruit are forming, it's also forming next year's buds that will produce next year's fruit. So this is a real consideration um, and you have to have to um, plan on thinning your crop. There's a lot of things that want to eat your fruit. There's just a list of, of some of the uh, insects and mites that like to feed on it. List of some of the diseases that like to feed on it. Um, and this is a real, real uh, concern and a real difference between annual crops and this perennial crop. Um, remember, we can't rotate these. So it's something we need to kind of manage in place. Now, I often hear that um, a lot of these are just cosmetic uh, and maybe we could sell through them. I would agree with that. On the uh, upper right, we have some sooty blotch on fruit. That is totally cosmetic. Um, it's also pretty disgusting and it's hard to actually sell fruit like that. But a lot of these other fruit we're looking at, you're looking at complete crop loss. And uh, I looked through my data some years ago to see where I had a head-to-head -head comparison of uh, fungicide treated versus no fungicide at all treated fruit. Um, and this was an old study that wasn't looking at that, but I had some head-to-head -head data and we saw anywhere from 50 to a 95% reduction in, in yield. This was a marketed yield. This is total yield um, on Macintosh, which is a highly susceptible variety to, to apple scab. Um, so you not managing for, for diseases, um, you know, can really affect not just whether or not you have good looking fruit, but whether you have any fruit at all. This next slide shows a similar thing and I'll kind of skip over it. Uh, but just also to, to reference, if you're going to be getting into the orchard business, you're probably going to need to think about, um, you will need to think about one way or another, how you're going to uh, treat these trees. Um, and I won't go into organic versus non-organic and specific materials. That's that's kind of for, for 201 of this. Um, but it's definitely something you need to think about if you're not used to uh, managing a spraying operation on your farm to begin with. There's a lot of different equipment. It doesn't always start with that uh, air blast type sprayer. So for a very small planting, you know, you might start with a, a backpack sprayer or one of these 12 volt sprayers. 
Uh, but over time, you're eventually going to move up to a larger piece of equipment. Uh, and that's something to plan on. One thing that gets tricky, and I think our other speakers will, will reference this, is um, uh, you can very easily outgrow your orchard to a reasonably priced piece of equipment. And I'll, I'll just skip past that and, and let them speak to it. Um, some of the key ideas to managing pests on a diversified farm or within the orchard, um, you know, following good IPM uh, practices, integrated pest management practices, meaning means going through a lot of other uh, steps before you need to spray. So there are, a, you know, a number of practices that are performed, uh, and we we don't have to assume that you're just going to be uh, loading up the sprayer every time you need to think about a, a, a disease uh, or or insect pest. And my job is to help folks through that. So um, there's support out there. There's also a uh, a, a regional uh, expert system um, that anyone can access that helps to run pest models uh, for growers to help implement uh, IPM practices. And we can talk about this at another point. I know I've presented this uh, at a, a veg and berry meeting, winter meeting a couple of years ago. We even have some of these on vegetable uh, farms. So we'll talk about this, but it, it takes um, data from a weather station, either on your farm or a neighboring farm or a nearby airport and runs it through some of the uh, pest modeling systems to help guide your pest management. Okay, wrapping up, um, can I make any money? So things can be really variable depending upon what your costs are, what the prices of your fruit are, the economy of scale. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side, I um, overly simplified things, but just threw a number on, out there. If you can grow 500 bushels of fruit and you can sell them for a buck a pound or $40 per bushel, that's a gross of about $10,000 an acre. Um, that's a lot less than you'll probably gross per acre growing vegetables, but the management and labor costs tend to be a lot lower. Um, your labor is concentrated in the pruning, in the harvest, and then some in disease management, uh, but really pruning and harvest. Um, so if you can prepare for and manage your biennial bearing, um, you can have a pretty long-term uh, planting that can pay you back for a long time. This is a fairly out of, somewhat out of date only because of, of inflation, but the, I think the, the relative values are similar. When we look at M9 versus M111, this is a dwarf versus a, a, a semi-dwarf type of orchard. The key piece I want to look at here is in this range, uh, a dwarf planting you know can start to pay back meaning you're making profit look at this orange column um, which is your net cumulative income after about the sixth year semi-dwarf planting after about the ninth year um, but as positive cash flow after that so that's about the range you're looking at six to ten years for payback period uh, but a big difference in the total payback based upon uh, the intensity of management. And that's, again, starts to kind of get into a, a 201 or, or, you know, another time to kind of uh, get into more of this in more detail. Speaking of more detail, um, I'm going to wrap up here and I'm going to leave this slide up for a minute, but then more importantly, I'm going to send it out uh, to the group. Um, there's a lot of other material that's available to you. I run the UVM fruit program where we have a, a listserv. Um, we have a website that, that got moved very recently so there's some some holes in it but it's it's uh we're, we're rebuilding it as we come along um but one great place to learn some more information on some real specific topics is the new england winter fruit seminar series that i'm working on with others from uh tree fruit extension around new england you see this series of about tw uh, 10 or 12 uh webinars coming up and with that i'm gonna sign off and and open things up to uh, the growers on the panel. So I think next up would be Nora Lake. And I'm going to bring up some of Nora's photos. All right. Nora uh, runs um, Sweetland Farm in Norwich, Vermont. And Nora, I'm going to let you, oh, this is going to time through it. I'm going to let you uh, explain how you decided to fit tree fruit into your operation. Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, we are primarily a vegetable farm, although we're also raising um, meat on pasture. We're doing about 500 broiler chickens per year, 
and we are just today sorting 15 pigs that came back from the butcher. Um, and we're also doing about five to 6,000 square bales of hay per year. Um, we knew right from the get-go that we wanted to be a diversified farm, um, and we're pretty sure that we wanted to have an orchard as part of that. Um, our veggies are primarily grown for our CSA, which at this point is about 300 CSA members. And we really wanted to have an orchard that kind of dovetailed with that operation. Um, and so when we bought our farm in the spring of 2012, we went right ahead and decided, okay, let's go ahead and, and get an orchard planted. Um, we have my friend Steve Fulton runs um, Poverty Lane Orchard, and so I had the opportunity to consult with him a little bit when we were getting ready to plant the orchard. And um, if I remember correctly, his biggest word of advice was wait a year before you plant your orchard. Um, his rationale was it's really good to prep your site and do all your planning and kind of get everything ready before you actually outlay the cash and, and put your trees in the ground. We completely ignored his advice, uh, which had its pros and cons. Um, I think he was absolutely correct that site prep was important, um, but we also knew that we were about to run headlong into probably the busiest 10 years of our lives, and that if we didn't get the orchard in right away, it was probably gonna wait 10 years. Um, so we took the plunge and we put in about 200 apple trees um, and about, I'm gonna say 75 pear, peach and plum trees. Um, we, we did pick a site that was on a slope. You can see our veggie fields are kind of down in the bottom there. And um, the orchard is, I would say about 300 feet um, long, rows about 300 feet long that run up uh, a, a little bit of a slope. Um, because we knew we were going to have this primarily as a, a piece of our CSA, we really wanted to have an extended harvest season. So we actually planted about 40 different varieties of apple um, with the idea that the earliest maturing ones would be ready sometime in mid-July, and then we would have little bits of fruit all the way through until December for some of the longer keepers. Um, one of the very first things that we did when we planted the orchard was we put up a high tensile electric fence for deer. We have a pretty significant deer population in our area, and um, we actually hadn't quite completed the fence when we planted the orchard, and lo and behold, a bunch of the trees did get nipped, and that set us back on those trees a little bit. Um, but now it's up and running and has, has a pretty good jolt to it. Um, <laughs> if I had one word of advice about fencing, it would be make your gates wide enough we scrimped a little bit and put in 10 foot wide gates that most of our equipment can just barely squeeze through. And if I had it to do over again, I would, I would definitely give myself the um, little extra wiggle room of a 12 or 14 foot gate. Um, the orchard is primarily semi-dwarf. Um, I think of all of the rows of apples, three of them, are true dwarf and 12 of them are semi-dwarf. Um, we did put a, a wooden stake at each tree when we planted it and you can see those little cross braces are what we used to add extra options for places to tie the tree off to to give them added support. Um, we also wanted to do as little spraying as possible and so when we planted the orchard we put down a four-ish inch thick layer of um, bark mulch, or I, I guess it was just really wood chips around the trees. Um, it added up incredibly in volume. I think in the end, it was about 40 dump truck loads of mulch. So I guess I would say, uh, do your math ahead of time and make sure that whatever 
um, resources you're using on, an, a, on a two to three acre orchard, you, you kind of get a sense of what the scale is going to be. Um, each tree also has a little one foot diameter of pea stone around the base, which was recommended to us as a uh, deterrent to, to rodents getting in on the trees. Um, we have been doing some pest management since the get-go. You can see each tree is painted white from about three feet up to the to the base, um, and that's a, a mixture of paint and joint compound, um, which is hopefully preventing some, some pests from getting into the trunks and also preventing sun scald in the winter. Let's see. So I guess labor-wise, Terry's absolutely right. Pruning is one of the biggies, and it's it's actually kind of nice for us because early in the spring, um, there's not as much work on the vegetable side of the operation. So we have some extra time for our crew to go out and, and prune the whole orchard. Um, I would say that the biggest challenge of the orchard for us has definitely been finding time to get out and work on it in the midst of all the other things that we're doing on our farm. Um, let's see, you can see there are some, some uh, rodent protecting tubes around the bases that we put on in the winter and take off in the spring. And we have had some pretty serious girdling when we didn't put those on. Um, and I would say that the biggest learning curve for me as a vegetable, as primarily a vegetable grower has been learning about all of the pests and diseases that can manifest in an orchard. Um, Terry's been super helpful on that. We've been doing as much reading as we can. Uh, the nice thing is for the first several years when we're really just trying to grow the trees and not so much the fruit, um, there it seemed like there was less to worry about now as we're just finishing up year nine and and we are starting to get some fruit uh i think there's going to be a whole nother host of pests and diseases to learn about and learn how to manage we are um practicing organic in the vegetable side of the operation and we realized pretty early on that that just was not going to be possible or we felt it was not going to be possible in the orchard um so we're attempting to do more of a low spray ipm approach um and it's going to be interesting as we start to get more fruit to weigh weigh the balance of uh yield and aesthetics and health of tree and see how that all fits in and um you know we're doing as much reading as we can in the winter i highly recommend asking Terry if he'll come out and walk through your orchard or your potential orchard site. He's been to our farm twice now and it's been like a fire hose of information that we just are scribbling down notes the entire time. Um, that's just another picture of, of the orchard and how it drains. The, um, the little structure on the bottom right of that picture is a, is a irrigation pump. You can't really see the pond that's at the bottom of the picture, but we did recently get a grant from NRCS to put in some drip irrigation up into the orchard. And so I think that's gonna be really helpful as we get more into the production years. Here's harvest happening, which is definitely a reward after eight or nine seasons of, of picking away at these trees. Um, I This is a little bit of a non sequitur, but I would say that in terms of site selection on a diversified farm, think about putting your orchard where you're gonna walk by it regularly. We have definitely found that ours is just far enough away from the fields and from the house that it's easy to ignore for long periods of time. And I think that if we were walking by and just doing a quick visual monitor of what's happening to the trees, um, we would maybe be a little more active in our management. Yay, apples. <laughs> um, we have uh, started to get some harvest on the plums as well. And that's actually been a really, really wonderful addition to the CSA and, and a little bit to our farm stand. Um, they're kind of a more unique fruit that people are pretty excited to see when it's out there. And um, fungus on the, on the plums is definitely an issue. So that's something that we need to learn more about. We did plant some peaches 
Uh, we have had terrible success, although occasional victories. This tree bore like this last season and then died over the winter. Um, but luckily I have some, some jars of canned peaches in my basement to remind me of how awesome it was and encourage me to plant some new trees. Uh, the varieties that we've tried have been Reliant, Glowing Star, and Finger Lakes. Um, and even though there's been, um, you know, even though our trees are planted on a slope where theoretically the cold is draining away, we are right on the border of where we can be growing peaches. Um, and, and we've lost every time, but they're such quick growers that I think I'm going to, I'm going to try it again. This is us loaded up to go to a farmer's market and the apples are just a really nice addition to the table in the, in the late summer, early fall. And occasionally we get a perfect apple and it's pretty exciting. It definitely makes, makes all the learning curve and effort worth it. And we also have pigs. And so if nothing else, we can turn the, the drops and the rotten ones into bacon. So it's been um, it's been really a good experience to have the orchard. I'm learning a lot. Um, I would do it over again with some reservations. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Nora's was uh, is is one that I often use when I in in my vegetable classes and some of my other classes to kind of highlight. Uh, this concept of integrating, uh, you know, tree fruit into a, a diversified farm, and you know, some of the the trials and tribulations. So, so thank you for sharing uh, your experience with us. Uh, is Sue Haney on the line? I'm not sure if she made it in here. I don't see her on the list, Terry. I don't either. Okay. All right. Well, Sue is another one that I that I. Um, uh, highlight she runs um and you you folks with your sweet farms got me all mixed up the other day um she runs a diversified farm in saint johnsbury with organic tree fruit as well as a bakery and uh candy shop um right near um sort of the dog mount actually i'm right up behind dog mountain um and so it's 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 been a uh uh tree fruit have been an in, a, a good way for her to add to that other draw um that's that sort of worked out well. So I think in the next five minutes or so, it might make sense to open up uh, to questions from the group and see what we can what we can answer and whether to scare you away from even considering this or uh, or to give you further encouragement. Yeah, and people can either unmute themselves or just type into the chat, and um, I'll keep an eye on that. So either way works. I, I Harry, have, uh, it's one of this here. Yeah, I, I want. I have a question hey. for Terry. Um, based on the, the last speaker, uh, okay. she spoke very highly of having you come out uh, to, to visit and give your perspective. And so I wonder uh, if you could uh, tell us uh, how to go about doing that. And uh, if I don't have a very large orchard yet, would you still come out? Yeah, good question. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this. Uh, more resources page. So I do, I mean, I do a lot of things at UVM. Um, I don't have a full, you know, extension appointment, but I do have an extension appointment. Right? And part of my, my job is to get out there uh, and visit folks. So the best thing to do is to just shoot me an email at this T Bradshaw with no W at uvm.edu. Uh, and I will get out there when I get a chance. Usually in the summer, I try to spend one day a week uh, visiting sites, and I like to visit. I mean, I'm a native Vermonter. I've, I I never joined the club, but I should have joined 251 because I've been to just about all of them, and I like to get back. Um, so yeah, just shoot me a line, and and I'm happy to to get you on there. Hey, Terry, and I don't worry about the size. I mean, everyone starts small. Go ahead. I was just going to say there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Vern is asking, um, what about deer fence? Most orchards install that and when? Uh, yes. Uh, I say I, I just got done answering an email to, from a uh, prospective grower, uh, and he was asking about, well, how badly do I need this? And he, he wanted to plant up to 10 or 15 acres. Uh, and 
you've got too much on the line in in Vermont to you know if you got a few trees at home you can put the chicken wire cages around them but once you get to any scale you really need to get it up um, I've I've got a great shot that I show in some of my classes um, of me with my home orchard with a tree inside the fence and a tree outside the fence and the growth is, it's its not even, it, they're not even like the same plant. In fact, the, the one that was outside the fence that kept getting browsed died eventually. Um, so you really need to think about deer protection. Ideally, I would, I would say uh, uh, essentially before you get the trees in the ground, because as soon as those buds open, uh, as the deer nibble them, that's, that's your growth for the season. Uh, and uh, so they can either completely shut down a young tree or on the flip side, the, the other question this, this perspective grower had was, um, do I need this for the length of the orchard? And, and Bill Lord, who was a longtime horticulturalist, um, tree fruit specialist at UNH, did a, a, an assessment back in the 90s. And it's hard to find the, um, that fact sheet. It's kind of aged out of the system. But um, just as simple arithmetic in terms of the amount of browsing that happens on a tree, it might not seem like a lot until you multiply it out. And it turned out to be, I forget the, the, the exact number, but it, the order of magnitude is right. It was like $5,000 of lost yield per acre. Um, so yeah, it's big. I would get that up uh, a good fence. And, and Nora's was a great example of, you know, a relatively inexpensive, you know, high tensile electric. Um, the, the Cadillac is the woven wire eight feet tall um but that gets pretty expensive so i'm gonna let nora answer this next question yeah um, nora i don't know if you can see the chat but um um there's a question for you from Jeannie, and she says do you have a sense of how your return on investment is going to look for the fruit trees do you know what year you plan to hit break even and are you on track Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't have all those numbers at my fingertips, um, but just like back of the envelope, I guess what we are, well, two things. First of all, CSA is a little bit of a complicated market to think about return on investment for, for any specific crop, um, and that's always been something that even in the vegetables I've struggled with to do, um, you know, sort of the recommended crop budgets because even though mescaline mix has a higher value we can't feed our csa members exclusively on mescaline mix um for the orchard i guess uh we would hope to be harvesting at least five bushels per tree um once production picks up and terry you can kind of weigh in with with uh critical comments here too um but at 200 trees and if you were hoping to get about $30 a bushel that would be um that would gross around $30,000 in a season um and i think that thinking about our costs to install the orchard we it's been a while but i would say we spent about $8,000 on the fence uh probably about fifteen thousand dollars on all of the trees um and a few thousand dollars on the on the bark mulch um so that's that's not a great answer to your question but that sort of starts to starts to send you down the direction of of where we're headed financially yeah, I think you're, that your numbers line up with mine. I, you you said about fifteen thousand dollars at full production at thirty dollars a bushel, um, and again, that's sort of the range you're you're looking at. I would say anywhere from eight to twenty five if you're growing a really high value variety and have a good market for it and can grow a lot of it, thousand dollars per acre. Uh, but usually in that sort of ten to twelve thousand makes sense. Terry, there's one more question. I know we should wrap up, um, so maybe this could be the last one, and anyone else is uh, should feel free to email you if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Susie, yep. Susie is going right for the grazing. Um, is it possible or recommendable to incorporate grazing animals behind electric fencing into an orchard row, either when the orchard is young and not producing, or when it is established? And how would that play into with food safety manure regulations? Yeah, um, it's it's something a lot of, of of people are interested in in 
some parts of the world, it's a key part of orchard management. You know, you think about that in uh, certainly in France with the sheep underneath the cider apple trees. You know, with food safety, it's kind of a dance you have to 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 do. Um, you know, yes, you're not picking the the apples off the ground. It's certainly if you have any animals in, you don't pick any apples off the ground. Um, and the question about you know when the last poop was dropped versus when the next apple will be harvested is you know a, a, a legal one to to think about in terms of FISMA. Um, I tend to avoid it and I tend to to shy away from it. I know some people are really interested in it um, when the trees are young potentially, um, but be careful that the the, the uh, animals aren't uh, doing more harm than good in terms of damaging the trees. You could potentially run sheep down the rows. I know some vineyards are moving in that direction, um, and that does seem to work for them. But it's it's not a simple let the animals in and let them do their thing. It's a highly managed system uh, where you move kind of flash flash graze in and out, uh, and so it it gets complicated. But I think it, it could be done. But it's not really a, a, an arena that I play in too much. Great, thanks, Terry. There's a couple comments too in the chat um, regarding that. Megan saying there are many farms in Vermont that regionally and regionally requesting silvo pasture as a practice. Yep. Um, so I think we should wrap up. Thanks um, very much, cool. Terry. Thank you. And Nora, excellent presentation, and it'll be posted on the uh, website.